So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Princeton Public Library. My name is Janie Herman. I'm the manager of adult programming, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this morning to the community room for a special book brunch today in honor of Women's History Month. This is our last event, Women's History Month. We've had a great month celebrating women. And today we're going to be discussing the recently released book, Betty Friedan, Magnificent Disruptor, which has been nominated for some awards and has been getting great reviews everywhere. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that. It was written by Rachel Steer, who is joined in conversation with Maria Di Battista. Um, and it's a homecoming for Rachel. So welcome back to Princeton, Rachel. Uh, two quick housekeeping notes before we begin. The room is equipped with a uh, hearing loop that pairs with key coil technology. If you require hearing assistance, we have headphones available for your assistance. And we kindly ask, of course, that you silence those electronic devices. And we will, um, I want to thank Labyrinth Books for being our partners and booksellers at today's event and in so many other events that we do here. And a book signing will immediately follow a discussion. Finally, the library acknowledges the National Endowment for the Humanities for their support not only of this program, but the many others that we offer at the library throughout the year. So before we begin, I'm going to just introduce both the author and moderator, and I'll let them take it away after that. Rachel Steer is an award-winning writer whose work has appeared in national magazines and newspapers, including the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. She is the author of three previous books, Strip Tease, The Untold History of Girly Show, of the Girly Show, Gypsy, The Art of the Tease, and The Steel, A Cultural History of Shoplifting, all very different topics than what we're going to talk about today. Uh, she's also the founder and current head of the Dramaturgy and Dramatic Criticism Program in the Theatre School at DePaul University. She holds a DFA in Dramaturgy and a Dramatic Criticism from Yale University School of Drama and a BA in Near Eastern Languages and Literatures from the University of Chicago. The moderator is somebody who's very familiar to our Princeton community, Maria D. Batista, who is a professor of English and Comparative Literature at Princeton. She specializes in 20th century literature and film, the European novel, and narrative theory. Her books include Virginia Woolf, The Fables of Anon, <clears throat> First Love, The Affections of Modern Fiction, and Fast Talking Dames. I'm so excited to have both of these authors here with us today to discuss Betty Friedan and her impact on history. I'm going to invite Rachel up to the podium for a moment before they begin the discussion. <coughs> Thanks, Janie, and thanks to the Princeton Public Library for having me, and of course, thanks to my parents who are here in the room, um, and to everybody who showed up today to have a conversation about Betty Friedan. Um, I'm just going to speak briefly, this is an in-conversation, but I am going to speak just briefly about how I came to write this book, because as Janie correctly points out, there is a subject gap between my first three books, which are about shoplifting and striptease, and my fourth book, which is a biography of the major uh, 20th century feminist writer and thinker, Betty Friedan. And so this story starts uh, 11 years ago in 2013, which happened to be the 50th anniversary of The Feminine Mystique, which is Betty's greatest Book, one of the things that she is remembered for, sometimes uh, demonized for, uh, and um, uh, yes, that's all I want to say about that. And then, um, uh, and so in 2013, I was asked to write an essay about the 50th anniversary of the feminine mystique and some other books by some uh, feminist authors who were just publishing that year. Okay, so for example, one of those books was Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. You people are nodding, so you know what I'm talking about. And so actually at that time, 2013, I had not read The Feminine Mystique, okay? Uh, I did not read it in college or graduate school. And um, so I had to read it in order to, to do the assignment. And so I started to read it. And what I would say about that is if you have not read it recently, I recommend that you do it, although it's a gigantic book. And there's many you know, critical things I could say about it. For example, I could say it's repetitive, 
perhaps you could say in some places it's dated. However, there are many uh, things that I would also say to praise the book. One of those things is the style of the prose and the sweep of the prose and the way that Betty's authorial voice grabs you and creates a case for women as a category, which at the time was radical, right? I mean, you have to put yourself back into uh, the time when she was writing the book, which was the late 50s, right? And you have to remember that at that time, women were not considered a social problem or a category the way that, for example, civil rights was considered. And that was really what Betty was trying to do with uh, the feminine mystique. And in the chapters of the feminine mystique, uh, each chapter takes on a different realm in society. For example, there's Madison Avenue and how that curtails women and forces women into the stereotype of the housewife and mother. And then there's higher education and how that realm does the same thing and then so on and so on psychoanalysis she goes through all the different realms of life and she creates a convincing case i think um it, the book is surprised me in one way in that by our standards it it, it does not make prescriptive suggestions um Right. In other words, at the end of the book, it doesn't say, and here's what you need to do to fix everything. <laughs> okay, the, the, the closest it gets to that point is that it says women should have something uh, that they want to do outside of the home that they're passionate about. And then it also, um, it also, uh, the, the one you know, political thing by our standards, again, that it, that it talks about is universal child care, federally funded child care. That is really the only thing. So anyway, I read the book for the first time and I really, as I was saying, I liked many things about it. I found it very interesting. And then I read the other books and what I found about these more recent books is that they borrowed from Betty's idea without really giving her credit um, or a lot of credit. In some places she got a tiny, tiny, teensy little footnote or something like that. But the scope and the ambition of the feminine mystique I thought was lost. And so that was the piece that I wrote um, and a lot of people liked it. And so I was invited after that, some, a little while after that, to write her Betty's biography for the series Yale Jewish Lives which is an excellent series. They've published, I just learned, 67 books in the series. They publish about six books a year. Um, and at first, to be honest, I said no. I did not want to do this. And one reason was uh, I had another idea of something that I, was, I wanted to write, and so I was pursuing that. Um, but another reason I hesitated was because, of course, in preparing to write an essay, um, about the feminine mystique and Betty. Um, I had done a lot of research, and one of the things I discovered was Betty's, uh, the thing that mo many people still talk about today, and I think is one of the um, reasons why Betty is still today not read as widely as she should be, or talked about in a more, um, in a way that really she deserves, which is her character. And, um, the previous biographies that had been written in the 90s are very negative about her character, and the people that I initially interviewed would say things to me like, um, well, 60 years ago she said something mean to me or something like that. <laughs> so I just began to worry as a biographer, you know, you have to have, you can't just write a, a, a hit job on somebody, right? You can't. A biography is, to write a biography is so much work. You can't spend, you know, a lot of time just attacking the character, the subject. So I hesitated, um, but then um, I kept researching and Yale kept coming back, honestly. They kept like, pursuing me. And after a while, I, I said, okay. And one of the reasons I said, okay, was because I thought that this would be an opportunity for me to try and investigate this woman who I felt had been demonized, marginalized, and to investigate questions of women and leadership and what it costs 
and can the questions like can you be a good mother and be a great female leader and how is that regarded in the press and so on and so on those kinds of questions and so i really i i began to think oh this you know what seemed initially like a not a great idea now is beginning to seem like a great idea so um i accepted the commission and then also at the time i naively and arrogantly thought I'll be able to finish this book in two years <laughs> and that will be that right it will be because I, I signed the contract in 2016 and I thought I'll just I'll you know one and done but that did not happen because once I got into it I began to discover how large a task it was and I began to really feel the weight of you know doing right by Betty which was the big um, my big effort in this biography and um, yeah and so I wanted to tell you this story because I think that there is often a question well Rachel what are your what are your first three books have to do with this book I, I think that they I would say all of my books are about people largely women who are stepping in some way stepping outside of societal expectations and also stepping on people's toes in some way and Betty certainly fits that uh, description. Okay, so without further ado, I'm now going to proceed to the conversation part, and I'm happy to answer more questions about this uh, in the Q&A portion. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, um, I, I don't think there's anything sort of arrogant. What is really sort of amazing about um, this, the, this book is that you do write by, by her without in any way kind of also being some of the sort of problematic aspects both of her thought and of her character. Yeah. So maybe I thought it would be very interesting to explore a little bit more um, sure. uh, how you overcame your hesitations. <laughs> and just as a, as a as sort of point of confession, uh, we realized just before um, this event began that neither of us um, we're about the same age, I think. Neither of us had actually read Feminine Mystique when we were young. Yeah. Um, that already sort of tells you that um, uh, Betty Friedan had maybe about sort of 10 years where she was really sort of recognized as the mother of modern feminism. And one of the things that Rachel explores in the book is how there's almost a kind of matricidal um, impulse in, in feminism that maybe is sort of traced back to um, uh, to, to free down herself because her character was so problematical and because she herself had such an ambivalent if not hostile relationship initially to what it means to be a mother and to give birth mm -hmm. not only to children but, but, but to a movement so anyway I, 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 um, it was really a revelation to read this book and and, um, uh, and, and come again against this magnificent disruptor so let's just start with the most magnificent disruption um, uh, that she's known for, and that is for the, the, the feminine um, mystique. Can you talk a little bit about how she herself came upon the material and what prompted her? Because at one point you say um, that ultimately it was her rage that fueled her intellectually, not just in terms of um, her personal relationships, but what was it um, that actually prompted her um, yeah. to take on and to coin this magnificent phrase, the feminist. Yeah, I mean, in, in, so um, in some ways to answer that question, I actually have to go back to her childhood. Um, I don't want, this is not a psychoanalytic biography, but um, nonetheless, um, it's hard to understand the roots of her rage without going back to her childhood. And so I go back to, she was born in Peoria, Illinois, um, which is about three hours south of Chicago. It's a small town um, in uh, southern Illinois. And um, she was born into a reformed Jewish family. Her father was a, uh, owned a, an, and ran a, a jewelry store, which was referred to as the Tiffany's of the Midwest. And her mother was a housewife. And um, as Jews in that town, uh, they were discriminated against. They were not allowed to join uh, the country club, for example, the big country club. And then um, Betty herself was a victim of anti-Semitism in high school. Um, so they, uh, you know, they were outsiders. I think is one is one thing, and and that fueled her rage from childhood. But in addition to that, she was an outsider in her own family. Um, her mother was very beautiful and very poised, and she had two 
siblings. She was the oldest child and she was a sickly child from birth. Um, she had numerous health problems, um, but she was in love with books. She read constantly and there were stories from her childhood of um, you know, her lugging the sack of books up the hill from the library and then when she got home, her father saying, you know, you're reading too many books, kind of how will you catch a husband kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, there, was, there was an anxiety about this and to the point where the parent, her parents actually took her to a psychiatrist to um, ask him, you know, is it okay that she's reading so much? So I guess what I, what I want to say is that there, she felt like an outsider in her own family. Mm -hmm. And I think that feeling never left, you know. I think she always felt like an outsider, even though in her life she ha had this enormous arc where she became an insider and, you know, she became a celebrity and she had known with people. But in the period of time when she was beginning the feminine mystique and she was gathering the material for that book, that was in the uh, mid to late 50s when she had gone to Smith College. So she had escaped Peoria and that gave her a, fe a feeling of belonging, although again, anti-Semitism did rear its head at Smith, but she felt that she belonged there because of the devotion to learning that um, you know that went on at Smith, and she was able to uh, discover politics, and she was able to discover um, uh, also journalism. She ran this student newspaper, um, and so um, she, in this period where she was gathering the feminine mystique material, she it was her 15-year anniversary of Smith, and she was married by that time, and she had three young children, and she was also a freelance journalist. She was writing for publications like, monthly magazines like Ladies Home Journal and um, Good Housekeeping, and she was struggling to fit into those magazines, into the pages of those magazines, in a way, as she had struggled her entire life to fit in, right, and she really couldn't fit in. Um, and she writes about this in, I think, a very uh, convincing way in The Feminine Mystique because she, she writes about how actually she felt that she was complicit in the formation of The Feminine Mystique because she would hear editors say things like, well, we don't really think we can run your story on civil rights and Martin Luther King Jr. because housewives wouldn't be interested in that. And you know, she would say, okay, I'll fix my story so that you know, you'll run it and pay me money, money for it. So she writes about how you know, to make it, she herself was complicit um, in the 50s. And then that's part, so that's part of her struggle. And I think another part of her struggle was just how to balance a family and continuing writing. I mean, she did not want to do what her mother did, which is not work. Her mother was a housewife. And a lot of people see The Feminine Mystique as being a book about how not to live the same way as your mother. I think it's more complex than that, um, but there's definitely that aspect of it. And the, the main thing that Betty meant by that was that she really wanted to keep working. That was what was important. I mean, she loved her family, don't get me wrong, especially her children. But she was, certainly by the standards of the day, a kind of in, indifferent, in some ways, mother. Like she said, you know, the, the kid, and the kids talk about this, this is not a secret. Um, you know, they talk about TV dinners that they had, and they talk about being um, put in taxis to go to school, and they talk about various other things. So Betty was very attentive on a certain level. Like she loved, um, you know, going out in the backyard and camping out and, um, like having like a, on the evening when Sputnik was in you know was in the sky, like the whole family spent the entire night like outside in the back. She loved that kind of thing. What she didn't like was anything having to do with cleaning, cooking, <laughs> 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 any of that. <laughs> and so you know, so the the kids got this kind of you know um, patchwork. I guess I would say patchwork. Um, I don't know mother mothering. And um, okay, so anyway, it was at this moment that she began to think, where is my cohort that I graduated with in, um, I graduated with uh, 15 years ago? And so she started to put together this questionnaire and the questionnaire had questions on it like, 
you know, all, everything kind of from intimate things, do you fight with your husband, do you make up with your husband, how long does it take, that kind of thing, <laughs> to, you know, what, do, are you still working, did you stop working, um, and, and she handed out this question at her 15 year reunion at Smith, she collected all the questionnaires and she put it all together and she made an article of, of, of it and the article was titled, are women wasting their time in college? Okay. <laughs> Later there was one, is, is, is it un-American to educate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and she couldn't sell it, okay? And every, she sent it to many magazines, everyone returned it or tried to change the ending. And she kept, you know, one of her good qualities was she was incredibly tenacious. She just would not back down, right? And this showed up in many different places in her life. And so she just kept working. She kept doing more research. She kept, you know, interviewing more people. And eventually, she happened to meet the uh, editor in chief of W. W. Norton, and that was how it became a book, right? That was how the um, like this article that she was working on became a book. Um, he actually wanted her to do something else, a different book, and she said, no, I want to do this book. So she, stu she stood up for herself, and she was, she was really powered by this idea of writing this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting about what you say in the book and what you've mentioned here is, should be, clear, um, should be made clear that the feminine mystique was not just um, a way of identifying the way, particularly in the 50s, women's role was um, pretty much confined by very traditional notions of femininity. But even on the left, and this comes to haunt her later, even on the left, there didn't seem to be any room um, for someone with her, really with her energy, right. with her vision, right. and with her um, resentments. Yeah, in some sense. that's right, um, that's right. Because one of the things that Feminine Mystique talks about is this problem with no name, and the problem is um, that women are not allowed to develop themselves in any way. They're always right. subsur um, right. subservient to someone else. Right, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So this, this, this feminine mystique, um, this word-making power that you sort of, you know, this kind of rhetorical magnificence um, that I think we see on and off throughout her career, I think begins with the feminine mystique, um, the problem that has no name. But there's another aspect that, I, that comes through the book that I'd like you to comment on, I wasn't aware of, and also I wasn't aware of your training in drama. She was fascinated by theater oh, yes. and by role playing. Yes, oh yes. Um, and she actually, uh, she would go to Esalen, she would experiment being yeah. different, there's one, you talk about at one point, she wanted. She played being Cleopatra, Betty yes. Davis, yes. and Scheherazade. Yes. Um, she, yes, she did. So in other words, the idea of an identity crisis is very much <laughs> also um, a, a, yes. as a kind of legacy yes. of the 50s and 60s, oh, women yes. trying to form an identity. Do you talk about this um, dramatic part yeah. of her character? Because it yeah. also has to do with what's problematic yeah. about her. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. That's. I'm so happy you mentioned that. I mean, so as a child, she took acting lessons. And she wanted to, to be an, an actress, um, but she didn't think she was pretty enough. And so she acted in one play at Smith College, and then she really stopped acting. But the theatrical strategies that she learned while studying acting and acting stayed with her. And she's not the only one in the second wave, by the way, who started out uh, as an actor or who had training as an actor. There are, there are others. Um, but if you ever listen to any of her speeches on YouTube or if you read them, I mean, they are the power of the rhetorical power and the flair, the theatrical flair is extraordinary. Um, so she absolutely was interested in the theater. And then, she, yes, she became very interested in um, alternative, I don't know what to call them, alternative, you know, the, the alternative culture of the 60s, yeah. Esalen. I mean, she was. She made, in Smith, she majored in psychology. Um, she didn't major in English, although she took another, a number of English classes. Um, and then she went for one year to Berkeley as a grad student um, in psychology, where she studied with people like Eric Erickson. Um, but she, it, again, she didn't really fit in there. And um, she was too theatrical, in a way, for them. And she was always searching for some different venue for herself. 
and trying to embody that venue. Um, and part of it had to do with searching for intentional communities. She spent um, like a lot of time trying to find a different home for herself that was not a nuclear family. So that was part of what Esselin was. Um, I mean, she was also, you're mentioning, the, you mentioned, uh, and rightly so, the negative dimension of this theatricality. And that, there is a negative dimension even in the feminine mystique, because the feminine mystique is a, mem it is a memoir, essentially. It's, yes, it's a work of nonfiction, but it, it, it's a memoir. And as a memoir, it's full of exaggeration. And it's full of hyperbole. Betty would never understate a case, right? She would always overstate the case. She, it's partly because she felt that she was not being heard, and so she's just like screaming, right, literally and on the page. And um, you know, the most famous example of that in the feministique is where, I think it's chapter 12, where she compares housewives to concentration camp victims, <laughs> which in me, you know, from, the from publication, um, you know, several critics were just, no, that is ridiculous, this is completely, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and later she um, recanted, you know, I think she would have rewritten that chapter if she could have. Um, but that's just an example, I think, of where her theatricality collided with, I don't know, her political, her desire to be a political player because I don't, I can't, I certainly can't think of another female figure who mm -hmm. has that same kind of, I don't know, larger than life theatricality. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, being a disruptor, you, you really can't be quiet in a way. And, <laughs> right. And it sort of comes through. She needed to be the center mm. um, of attention. Yes. And sometimes right. that led her to yes. kind of extreme statements, which, yes. which she had to, yes. um, uh, she had to recant. Mm -hmm. uh, it also um, kind of led her to kind of double down on positions, and so mm -hmm. she, in some sense, she's one of the founding mothers of Mao. Yeah, um, right. And you sort of talk about the origin story, but one of the things about the feminine mystique is, let's say, one of the foundational texts, and she, as a leader, um, as a as a as a uh, as a kind of mother of the movement, is that she, uh, as she goes, so she feels more and more um cast aside yeah. about this trying to create a community of women and yeah. answering to their needs yeah. um, pretty much um starts to sort of fray yeah. and sort of fall apart yeah and she the disruption now is within the movement not just something that she is right. sort of fighting outside so can you talk about um because it's part of the dramatic yes um, um i think sort of energy of her life it's kind of almost the sadness yes um, of her career yes um that when she came to deal with people like bella absag or gloria steinem yes um there really was yes um, uh, there was all of this sort of tension yes. Yes. And the disruption that kind of led to this, I think, very toxic myth that, that women, in some sense, are always fighting the screaming. But basically, yeah, feminism yeah. became a cat fight. Yeah, right, um, right, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, Betty is known for two things. I call her Betty because I worked on her. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so, but um, it, the feminine mystique and then the founding of Now, which was in 1966. And Betty was the first president. She actually did not want to be president because she knew, her, you know, she knew that she had this kind of theatricality, and she worried. And she said, "I have a writer's temperament. I don't think I can lead a national movement." But people insisted, and so she eventually gave in. And then now accomplished extraordinary things. I mean, I do not want to downplay that at all. The amount of legislation. Um, that was passed would not have been passed without now. I, I'm certain of that. But within two years, um, there began these enormous fights uh, within now. The fights basically had to do with the fact that so many younger women were streaming into now. And those women had more different ideas than Betty. Betty's ideas about now and what the, mm -hmm. the mission of now were basically old left ideas, labor ideas, and they were, you know, universally funded childcare, pay equity or equality rather, um, equality in re political representation and reproductive rights, right? So they were, they, you notice I didn't mention anything about down with the patriarchy or um, you know sexual identity. Betty was completely not interested in any of in those last two things, and younger women were. 
And so there, and those younger women included Gloria Steinem, um, who was 12 years younger than Betty. She was not a member of NOW, but she was a rising figure in the women's movement. And she was tall, she was elegant, she was very well spoken, she was a journalist. And the media just adored her, they just ate her up. Whereas Betty, the media did not adore, right? And they ridiculed her. So, um, yeah, by 68, 69, there began to be just all these fights. And, um, and Gloria and then Bella Abza, yes, Bella is, was all on the Gloria side and, and supported, for example, a big issue in 69 was should lesbian women be allowed to make their platform a central part of NAP? Betty was against this. She you know, notoriously called that the lavender menace. Okay. She later apologized, right? But it was too late, right? It was by 1977 when she apologized. So, um, you know, just there were there were many, many of these sites because Bet one thing Betty was very clear on about now was that she want she did not want there to be subgroups. Um, she wanted there to be one big platform for women. She wanted men to be involved. She didn't want it to be separatist. And the reason was she worried that the women's movement would not be taken seriously. Um, but you know, because that was her main concern, she kind of missed the boat on some of these issues. And, um, and she ended up in 1970, she stepped down from the presidency of now. And then as Maria says, she sort of became kind of marginalized, but she continued to fight with Gloria and with Bella Abzug, um, like a, a, a famous fight was after she left now, she continued to found organizations. I mean, and this is like what her great strength was, was starting things. So she founded the National Women's Political Caucus, which was solely devoted to getting women into political power in 1971. And she founded it with Gloria and with Bella. But um, Gloria and Be they quickly fell out because Gloria and Bella wanted it to be a progressive organization, whereas Betty really wanted it to be across the aisle, Republicans and Democrats. Betty was the only, um, I think, member of of now or um, you know, um, women women's activist who went to both who attended both the. Democratic uh, convention in 1972 and the Republican convention in 1972. Right? She was really committed. She and she really believed that, you know, to get reproductive rights, um, you know, to, to get it where she wanted it to be, it needed to involve both Republican women and Democratic women. Um, you know, she was not well received at all at the Republican convention, and the accounts of that, I mean, are just like of her seizing the mic, like at whatever whatever meeting, like she didn't even care what the, what the <coughs> meeting was supposedly about. She would just seize the mic and start talking about reproductive rights at this Republican, at the Republican convention, you know, so, and then, you know, so, I mean, um, I think, you know, there's just, there's a lot of different things going on, but you're absolutely right to say that part of it is definitely her, the way she presents herself, and then I think part of it is the, as more and more women became interested in the um, women's movement, obviously people have different there's, ideas there's, about yeah, what it should be. Different ideas, different convictions, different convictions, both about policy but also about strategy. Yeah, and identity. And yeah, identity. And identity. Yeah. And, yeah. So two things about identity, then I'll turn it over to the audience. One of the uh, first, I just want to pull back a bit. Um, you describe her as a visionary, and she is a she is a political visionary, and she did sort of put just the idea of women, the life of women, the identity of women front and center <clears throat> as a political um, objective. Mm -hmm. um, but she also had this idea, which really I was struck by, um, that one of the ways in which women would be emancipated is if there were architectural changes yes. to the way. Right. So she, right. she became very interested in the right. way suburban um, uh, blueprints yeah. really helped perpetuate the feminine mystique, that if somehow you could get uh, plans uh, where you opened up the house, you wouldn't have women confined to the road. Because you talk about, so she was very interested in architecture as, a, as, as actually a kind of political, yeah. a political art. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think this arose out of her utopian <laughs> desire yeah. for a different kind of living arrangement than just the nuclear family 
also, I should say, she was getting divorced in 1970, mm -hmm. 71. And so she herself was looking for a different kind of um, living arrangement. She had a horror of being regarded as a divorcee, and she not just for, because personally she had a horror of it, but because <coughs> she worried about what it would do to the women's movement if people found out that a divorcee was running the National Organization for Women. She worried that it would be discredited, so she hid all of this for a long time. But she was she was thinking even then about um, you know how could there be a space where there would be a child, there would be a space for, I guess, group childcare, but then people would have their individual living spaces, and people wouldn't be so divided up, like as they are in the suburbs and the exurbs, right? And they wouldn't be so far away from each other. And she lived in a number of, you know, she tried, she had a number of experiments, where she wanted one her daughter calls the so-called commune, because it was in East, East Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> big house that she inhabited with you know and then of course it broke down right the idea broke down because she didn't want to like do the dishes right you know like if you're in a communal living situation with people you have to share the responsibilities also and she, she, so she you know again she had this uh, so she had these ideas but they didn't really get exactly fulfilled in a, in a I think way that could be certainly not a way that could be reproduced mm -hmm. yeah and the reason I bring it up is because um, uh, one of the things that emerges from your very intricate complex and fair-minded portrait of her is that this um, image of her, which is a pretty much uh, standard image, is not just a magnificent disruptor, but a kind of harridan. Yeah, yeah. Um, she was. She actually changed. She, uh, she, she would be recanted yeah. about yeah. the lavender menace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she became. She regretted the fact that she seemed to stigmatize housewives. Yes, she did. And the, and the, um, feminist the feminist mystique. Yeah. And then, um, since this was for the uh, series on Jewish lives, maybe just before we turn it over, yeah. talk about her kind of reconciliation with her own mother, who she had a very um, yeah. vexed relationship yeah. with, and her Jewishness. Yeah, I mean, well, um, I mean, one of the ironies about her relationship with her mother is that, you know, Betty's whole idea of her mother was locked into her relationship with her as a child, right? And Miriam actually herself, Betty's mother Miriam, had a huge arc, right? She she once, um, Betty's father died when she was in graduate school in 1943, and Miriam took over the business. And then Miriam um, left Peoria, got remarried, um, you know, took up these other uh, businesses, right, and, you know, had a whole other life in California, basically. <laughs> so she was not a static figure at all. Um, Betty, and I don't, but they didn't really have a reconciliation until Mir Miriam was on her deathbed, um, which was a kind of tragedy. And then, um, I'm sorry, oh, the Jewish thing, yeah. And I think, yeah, like a lot of other things in Betty's life, yes, yeah, she really evolved as someone who, she couldn't really talk about her own Jewishness until she was in her 50s, so until she was, that was the 70s. Um, and, um, you know, she, it was also when she had been ostracized from the women's movement, and so she looked to Jewish audiences to bring her message and to also to convince um, Jewish audiences that um, feminism was not bad for the Jews, that it could coexist with family. That was her big thing. She was a pro, uh, pro family feminist, and this was the time when. Uh, Phyllis Schlafly was on the rise, so and and the ERA was in jeopardy. So Betty was really doubling down on this audience to try and sway people to vote for the ERA or to get their, you know, to get their uh, Congress people to vote for the ERA. And so that was part of it. But I think also it was connected to her idea about home and what was at home. And she became interested for a little while in kibbutzes, and she made several trips to Israel some of which went better than others. <laughs> one, one of them, she was very angry because there was no uh, Israeli translation of the feminine mystique, um, there, a Hebrew translation yet, and so she became very angry about that. But on another one, she helped uh, Israeli women start a uh, feminist, uh, the first independent feminist movement, um, and she became also involved in the United States in uh, in, in some efforts, like institutionally Jewish efforts, um, again, to 
kind of get more women into leadership. She was definitely supportive of women, female rabbis, um, and so on. So it, it, you know, she had a huge arc, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, so many of the issues that she really grappled with were, were still, we're still the, 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 pro yeah. the problems yeah. may have names yeah. now, but they have they certainly yeah. haven't been resolved. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you both. <laughs> Very much. Two questions. No? Uh, the first question is what are her children doing now? The second question is looking at the arc of her time as an alumna of Smith College, what has been Smith's College institutional response? to her at various points in time during the arc of the rest of her life. Okay, so her children um, are all very successful uh, and they have their own families. One is a pediatrician, another is a, an architect actually and builder, and the third one is a MacArthur Genius Grant award winning uh, physicist. Wow. So they're very successful. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, and then to the Smith College thing, well, so, you know, uh, I spoke at Smith in the fall, <laughs> so, you know, there's some interest in Betty there, but I will, I would be remiss if I didn't say in the fifth, mm, you know, in the, in the 70s, late 60s, I mean, they were interested in Gloria, who was also a Smith grad first, yeah. and right. Betty was very angry about that. Um, you know, they gave her an honorary degree first, and but she got one later, right? She got one later, but you know she graduated first, so she got <laughs> you know, like, you know? um, So I mean, I think um, what what would I say about it? I don't know. I had a really good time talking at Smith. Um, I think that I think um, you know, like a, I don't know, a lot of places that were associated with Betty somehow in the twentieth century. I think there's a kind of wariness about her right towards her. Um, like just a hesitation of like how should we regard this person like is she a hero or is she a villain like who is she um, you know so I think it's undecided um, but none, they did give Gloria the degree first so. <laughs> this is a scholarly question um, Smith, Smith was known for the Sophia Smith papers where all the archives are are her papers there no. Uh, well, some of them are, some papers are there. Betty, um, you know, she talked with Smith about giving Smith her papers. However, she, you may know this, but she, she decided ultimately to give them to Harvard because uh, Smith would not give her enough money uh, for her papers. They're at the Slesinger. So the major group of papers is at the Slesinger. There are some things at, um, Smith, like uh, I don't know, you know, oral histories and whatnot, but not the bulk, not the bulk. Yeah, yeah. Okay, way back here. Hang on. Why do you suppose that W. W. Norton took a chance on a debut author like Betty? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to try to tell the story as shortly as possible. So, um, because Betty wrote, when she was being a freelance journalist in the 50s, she wrote one cover story for Harper's Magazine, which was about these two scientists. She had, she had moved to Rockland County, New York, um, Grandview on Hudson, uh, which is near, um, uh, I forget the name of the observatory. It was a, it's near an observatory, a, a big observatory where these scientists um, and the, the, these two scientists worked. And the scientists had um, developed a theory of ice ages. And Betty learned about this right after the birth of her daughter, which was uh, like 1956. And she learned that, you know, about these scientists and about this theory. Um, it was the first theory of the ice ages, to ice age, the, and why ice ages happen to ever get any um, media, like pop, popular media attention. And so Betty wrote this cover story for Harper's about these two scientists. And the story, I see it, 
as kind of a, um, it's kind of a dry run for the feministique, although it's a very different subject, obviously, but it's very personal. Um, it, you know, she, 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 she positions herself kind of in the story. Um, it's very, she, she, she treats the scientists as characters, you know, which upset them, by the way. They were upset. They felt that they were not accorded the respect that, that they deserved in the story, right? Because it was not serious enough, right? But it was, it's a very, you can read it online. It's in the Harper's Archive. It's a very lively story, but it, it was a cover story and it then made it to the best, uh, the like best anthology, you know, Harper's best anthology, uh, which included people, also people like Mark Twain. So Betty was in this, all of a sudden, Betty was elevated into this group and um, the George Brockwell, who was the Norton editor, he saw this story and he was like, oh, let's get her. That's how it happened. <laughs> yeah. Are there other questions? Oh, yeah, right here. Um, we, I think most people saw the State of the Union in the rebuttal. And then, of course, Saturday Night Live did a thing uh, with Scarlett Johansson. And one of the things she mentions is they position the senator in her kitchen. How would you think Betty, because women love kitchens, how do you think <laughs> Betty or Dan, and how can you trace where we've come I mean, or yeah. maybe where we're going yeah. from that? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think Betty was, you know, she did move to the center, right, politically. That that is true, and um, you know, and she did re she recanted on several things, um, but she was always worried till the end of her life about women's issues and women's justice, and she felt that we had stalled, especially after the ERA did not get ratified, and. Um, you know, and so I think she would say we stalled, or even we have slid backwards, right? And that we haven't the things that I mentioned that were the some of the central points of now, the central missions of now, like equal pay, equal political representation, reproductive rights. Those things have not really been achieved. So I think she would be extremely upset. Yeah, a kitchen. I mean, come on. That's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a bookshelf. Yeah, right, a bookshelf. Yeah, and it was also the way uh, that we were talking about that kitchen scene. She was talking in that voice of a, they call it the uh, Fundy Baby voice. Oh, yeah, right. You know, it was like very much right. trying to appeal to women. And, right, yeah. right, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions? Yeah. Okay. So following up on that, you know, there's this movement within, I guess, TikTok, social media, on the, the trad wife. Oh, yeah. Which, yes, and so this idea of the traditional, the young woman kind of almost play acting mm -hmm. what a traditional wife would be. And I've had multiple conversations with my daughter since I gave up cooking during the pandemic. And <laughs> I just felt like there's nothing in my DNA that says, that I'm good at cooking, and I mean, I am good at cooking, but regardless, anyway, this idea that it is playing, it's like play acting, and I do wonder what Betty Friedan would think of that, and this idea that she'd been pushed aside, when really we should be revisiting yes. what she wrote, and we should, even yeah. though she's complicated, pulling out those pieces that are still, we do not have childcare, all those things you've said, and these women, young women playing traditional wife, at some point, that falls apart as well. Yeah, and I think I think it suggests that we have not made as much progress as we think that we have. And although I think quite a lot of progress has been made in areas of identity and sexual freedom, right? I don't think a lot of progress has been made in um, those issues like the old left issues that Betty was talking about, economic issues, basically. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> do you ever um, speculate about what Betty would have done if she were born in the '60s or '70s? You know, yeah. What direct would she have become an actress and not become political? Or do you have any? You know, I mean, I I definitely think if she had been born later, she would have had a completely different life that was maybe freer. Yeah. Um, you know, than the one that she had. I think she herself was very. 
um, trapped, you know, she, and she felt very trapped, and that actually accounted for her great work and explained it and explains it in some way. And so, yeah, I, I definitely, I think maybe she wouldn't have felt as much pressure to marry, for example, or even to have a family, um, you know, and maybe that would have liberated her. And I also think, um, as I think I said earlier um, in this conversation, she was a sickly child and she struggled with various health issues uh, for her entire life and she had two heart transplants and so she was, she was ill, you know, she was ill and the treatments for all of those things changed quite a bit and maybe she also would have been in better health and so that would have changed, you know, things, I don't know. Yeah. Would have been less pissed off all the time. Maybe she was. Maybe I don't know. I'm pretty pissed off all the time. All this. I was born in 1964. Okay. One last question. I'm curious. I mean, she spent so much of her career encouraging equal representation and being invested in women running for office. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more, given. I think for better and for worse in our contemporary moment, the idea of disruptors in public office is certainly not an unfamiliar um, situation. But I, you know, reflecting on her career and, and that part of it, you know, did she ever consider serving in office herself? And over the course of her life, where did she land on what women needed to do to be better represented in public office? Yeah, I mean, she she definitely wanted to be in public office and considered it, I think she would have been terrible and I'm glad that it didn't go any further. Did she get elected? Um, I don't know if she would even get elected, but you know, she just didn't have, she had the galvanizing thing and she had the, she was tenacious, you know, she would chase down these senators at their vacation homes and be like, you have to vote on this way. You know, but then in terms of making, um, uh, you know, getting people like together, like and working together and doing delegating. She was not good at any of those things. So I, it's hard for me to see how she would have. I think um, Bella Abzug obviously was great. Um, she also was a lawyer, right? And Betty did, was not a lawyer. Um, Shirley Chisholm also, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I don't know, yeah, I don't know how to answer your question. You know, I, I, I wish there were more women in office now. I feel like um, there aren't enough. And I think if there were more, maybe we would be having a different political conversation than we're having. That's what I think, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Took me back. <laughs> but it's part of the power of now, uh, the Princeton Now, organization was started, it was the first in the state. Mm -hmm. And a group of us got together when we realized that the books that our children were reading at school, mm -hmm. the Dick and Jane, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. see Dick do and right. Jane watch, right, right. we got together and uh, did a research project which ended in a book called Dick and Jane as Victims. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, uh, in, it, the, working together with other women was something new. Mm -hmm. um, I was a young mother, and mm -hmm. um, just the power of, of, the, of what we did and how we, we literally changed the books. We worked with a group of women in New York mm -hmm. who connected us with publishers. Mm -hmm. We met with the publishers. Mm -hmm. They came to New York. Mm -hmm. Presidents and vice presidents mm -hmm. of Alton Mifflin and, and Scott Forsman, et cetera. They hired us to consult mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. We met with them um, in their offices. The authors of these books were women. Mm. But anyway, it, 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 did, mm -hmm. it was a, a big movement in yeah. education, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. which I was yeah. thrilled to be a part of. Yeah. 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 Positive note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great positive note yeah. to end on. Yeah. So thank you so much. I think Thanks. this was the perfect way to cap off our Women's History Month. Um, and I hope that, I think this is a great way. I hope your biography not only encourages people to read your book, but also to go back, as you said, and um, read the Feminine Mystique, either reread or read it for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I do want to mention before we go, um, we actually, I guess, this is going to be an event. Uh, I said to uh, Maria de Batista when I saw her, we didn't see each other in a little bit, and uh, said, and I get to see you twice in one week. Mm -hmm. So in case you're not aware, uh, on Thursday night, uh, the library and Labyrinth, we often do events together. We're going to be over at the store at 6 p.m. 
and it's going to be a conversation about uh, Joyce Carol Oates um, new book, which is Letters to a Biographer. And so it's four decades of her letters um, that she wrote between her and her pen pal, uh, Greg Johnson. And it's a really um, in-depth look at Joyce as a, a person. Amazing. Um, so that's going to be another great conversation. That's Thursday night at Labyrinth Books. So uh, we get to have a, a, a double header with Maria this week, which is great. <laughs> and Rachel, thank you for coming. Thank you.